Hi, it's Dr. Ogden. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at ecology. So ecology is the scientific study of the interactions between organisms with their environment. And when we look at ecology, we always kind of divide it up into two main parts, where there is the abiotic component, so everything that's non-living, the chemicals, you know, oxygen, water, carbon dioxide, and so forth, and the physical factors. And then there's the biotic component, the living, everything that is living within the ecosystem. And sometimes people get confused the, the word environmentalism with ecology. Ecology is the scientific study. Environmentalism is more of the awareness that um, we need to have with, the, in, with our environment. And so, you know, there's lots of things that have led to environmental awareness. One example is DDT, which was used by the US government in order to combat mosquitoes. And it was very good, but it had lots and lots of harmful side effects. One of the people who wrote an important book that talks about this is Rachel Carson, and she wrote this book called The Silent Spring, which helped bring about the awareness of um, environmental issues. So when we look at ecology, there's basically four levels that we like to think about. Organismal ecology, looking at just the organism. Pop population ecology, looking at a bunch of individuals of the same species. Community ecology, looking at all of the living organisms living in the same place at the same time and ecosystem ecology, which brings in those abiotic factors into the community. So in organismal ecology, this is also the one that really overlaps with evolution, because this is where we look at the types of adaptations that enable organisms to adjust and change in order to live in their environments. So three possible adaptations that we could talk about would be physiological, anatomical, and behavioral. For example, in physiological response, you know this, that when it's cold or, or if you get frightened all of a sudden, your hair stands up on, on ends and you get the, the goosebumps, right, that occur. Well, that's, uh, the reason that that's there is because for mammals, um, if you are cold or frightened, a mammal would do that, and if you have lots of hair and fur, it actually creates a, creates a larger um, barrier of air from the outside air to the air that's close to your body and so it can keep you warmer um, and and then it also you know when a cat gets scared or something it's its fur stands on end the reason that it does this is there is this erector pili muscle so that is a response to a specific um, uh, something that's happening in the environment like temperature or or, or the flight or f fight or flight response being initiated and so this muscle is flexed you can also, though, acclimate, which means that you respond over with a little bit longer term change. And this happens to those who, you know, climb high mountains. They have to stay at base camp for a while. And when they, if you look at them before and after they've stayed at ba base camp, you'd actually see that their red blood count, for example, goes up. And that's because they've acclimated to the higher elevations with less oxygen. If you look at vertebrates that don't have the ability to um, change to uh, change their own body temperature so they have to the environment has to change your body temperature like lizards you can see that there's lots of lizards that live in the southwest and almost no lizards living in the northern part of the United States where it's really really cold so there's also anatomical responses. Many organisms can respond to the environmental change with some type of change in their body, like the summer coat of, a, of this rabbit and the winter coat. It's the same species. It's not a different species. The sunflowers, and of course, they follow the sun through the sky. And how do they do that? Well, they have a response in this, or in this area of the plant called the sheath pulvinus, which can be um, inflated or, or deflated. And as it does that, the the uh, flower head moves around the sky, you know, or here's a tree that grows its all of its branches in the direction with the wind. It doesn't need to try to do it against the wind. It anatomically responds to the wind and then just grows in one direction. Behavioral changes are also another way that plants and animals can respond to the environment. And humans are obviously very good at this. We put on thick winter coats. We carry umbrellas around with us. So now we're going to look at population ecology. In population ecology, one of the things that ecologists look at is called population density. Now, basically, this just means how many individuals of the same species are living in a certain area at the same time. So, right, the species per unit of area or volume. And of course, one way to do this would just be to go and count, right, every individual, kind of like we do when we take a census. 
But we can't really do that with organisms. They're not going to stand in line or fill out a form. So rather what we do a lot of times is do indirect in indicators of the population size. So look at all of these prairie dogs. One way to calculate the number of prairie dogs living you know, in the Great Basin or, or in a certain area is you could actually just calculate the average number of prairie dogs per hole and then just count the number of holes. You wouldn't even have to count every hole. You could just look at the big area, count a few and extrapolate out to the entire area. Also we use um, sampling techniques, something like for example a mark or and recapture method where you trap animals, a certain effort is given to trapping and marking, then you release them and then you go back and do another effort to recapture and based on the number of recaptured individuals you plug all of those numbers into a formula and you can come up with a population size. Now as we watch populations grow we see something very interesting. For example if we start off with one bacterial cell, okay, it takes 20 minutes for E. coli to divide. So after 20 minutes, we now have two cells. After 40 minutes, four cells. After 60 minutes, eight cells. Right? After 80 minutes, 16 cells, and so forth. And this continues to grow and grow and grow. And after 12 hours, you now have two to the 36 cells. Right? And if you plot this out, this actually ends up looking like exponential growth curve. So an exponential curve here. Right? Now obviously, at some point though, the bacteria here is going to run out of resources. And so what we see in the real world is not exponential growth always. In fact, what we more see is a curve that looks like this where it's called a logistic curve where it has parts that look kind of exponential but then it starts to taper off and eventually reaches some maximum. Maximum, we call that maximum the carrying capacity. And this is an example of these fur seals where you know they were heavily hunted in the early um, in the late 1800s and early 1900s and then they were protected and once they were protected their colony began to grow again and the numbers were very very low and then began to grow but they didn't continue to grow exponentially they leveled off and they leveled off right at their carrying capacity so you can describe exponential growth and logistic growth um, in this way this is kind of how they compare they they're, they mimic each other for quite a while but then the logistic growth tapers off and hits the carrying capacity. Sometimes though populations grow in a very um, in a way that is also interesting and we, we, when we see this type of growth we call it density dependent growth because there are density dependent factors. So for example we see that as the number of breeding pairs increase, so as you get more and more bird, bird mommies and bird daddies breeding, you, at, you get a clutch size that is smaller and smaller. Right? So the fewer the number of parents, the more eggs they're having. The greater number of parents, the less number of eggs each pair is having. And a lot of this has to do with, you know, they're out finding the food and the resources and, and they're more crowded and everything and that leads to less eggs. Same thing if you look at like beetles in a, you know, these uh, flower beetles in a sack of flour. Uh, the more dense that the population of beetles becomes, the less survive, right? So the percent chance of survivorship decreases over time. Sometimes also we can see organisms that grow very rapidly. I mean it looks like exponential growth but then something will happen and you'll have this huge sudden decline like a freeze for example. If you get an early freeze or on, on that it's really cold, maybe all of the aphids that are living on a plant suddenly die, almost all of them completely die off. And so you can have density independent factors as well. So when you talk about population growth, we can't do this without also mentioning something about human population growth. And as we look at the, the history of human population growth, we've actually been a very, um, not very populous species on the planet for many, many years. But then we gradually start to gain a little bit more and then in the more recent years we've had this huge explosion of population growth. You can even see here this little dip here is, is where we lost a third of the population due to the Black Plague. And so the question comes up, well, can we continue to grow forever? And obviously, as we've seen with all other organisms, no. All organisms are subject to the logistic growth model. So even though humans' growth look like it's exponential, at some point this has to level off. And when would that be? Well, there are certain models that demonstrate that that's probably anywhere between, between 10 to 20 uh, billion people on the planet. Some models, though, go as low as even 6 or 7 billion, and we're already at 7 billion. So some models even say that we're about our, our carrying capacity, but most models um, anywhere from 10 to 20, maybe, maybe we could say 15 is a good average number of about what our carrying capacity here is on Earth. 
You can also split up the different populations into ages. And so if we look at the percentage of a population that lives in these different age groups, you can see that a place like Kenya is a rapidly growing place of the world where the human population is growing nearly exponentially. In the United States, we have a very slow growth um, where we're still growing because the green bars are still you know, slightly bigger than the yellow bars just above them. Uh, and then in Italy where you have zero growth or even a decline where the green bars are smaller than the bars right above than the yellow bars above them. And you know as you look at these graphs, these graphs are not just used for biologists. Many actuaries or people who work in statistics will look at graphs like these because this will help them um, predict certain social economic um, repercussions that are going to happen in the future. For example, if you look at the bubble right here, these are the baby boomers, and this graph's actually a little behind, but because now these baby boomers are all retiring, and so what you have is this conundrum of Social Security. It's basically, under the current system, almost impossible that the workers, this working class, is going to be able to support this retiring class.